Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, relentlessly working actor, Reed Diamond. And now, Rich Redman. Alright, what is up Rock and Rollers? Yeah, it's that time, another episode of the Rich Redman Show, coming to you from Music City, and today's guest on the outskirts of Los Angeles, I think in wine country, we're going to get into that, but Jim, I always say I'm excited, but each time yeah. is the excitement just grows and grows and grows, because today's guest is another celebrated American actor for TV and film, his first film Memphis Bell is celebrating 30 years, and you know him from TV shows like Homicide, Life on the Streets, The Shield, Agents of Shield, The Mentalist, the list goes on and on. Our new friend, Reed Diamond. How are you, man? What's up, guys? Oh, my gosh. I'm so, I mean, yeah, yeah. Was it, did you cut the applause short? (laughs) Oh, feels good. Feels so good. No, man. (laughs) Ah, it's it's either applause or a car crash, the way it was coming through. Well, you know what's so funny is that people are just having to jib and jab and, you know, move forward with this crazy Zoom technology. Oh, yeah. Jim and I usually like to record this in in my studio in in, uh, the Music City, USA, and then this crazy thing happens. Um, we were a just little, talking a little pandemic. Yeah, right. just a yeah, little yeah, yeah, global yeah, so pandemic. Kind of, no. um, so we, uh, your wine country, Santinez. Yeah, Santinez Valley. So yes. it's just, it's this little secret place. You ever see? You know, if you've seen the movie Sideways, a right? million times. Exactly. Right. Right. And that's and that's where this is. So this it's this little hidden jewel. It's it's right on. You know, it's behind the mountains, the Santinez Mountains from Santa Barbara. It's it's two hours, two and a half hours uh, north of Los Angeles. And if you go on the highway, if you go on the main highway, you'll just drive by right by it. You'll see where the Anderson Split Pea Soup is, yeah. which everyone's you know. And you know, I'm not gonna stop there. You're on your way somewhere else, and you even know there's this hidden valley full of wine obviously and a lot of alcoholics yeah. and um and uh you know some actors some uh cowboys real cowboys uh some musicians and it was a great place i lived here we moved here eight years ago and probably my wife and i started coming up because of the movie sideways yes and and then now we live in toronto canada which seems uh prescient well, well you know it's i i, I was mispronouncing I, I was calling it santinez santinez Santa, well, you know, yeah, you, you were just being cool. You were just taking out one of the syllables and you were just making it just a whole thing. Santa now, Nez, is the was... Maverick Saloon still there? Oh, dude. Okay, so of course. Because I know, played there know. a million times. Right, so you know it super well. So the Maverick, and the Maverick is that place where when you should go home, that's where people go. Um, lots of, it's still, it's still, it's, it's under new ownership right now. Um, uh, so I think it's a little kinder, gentler, and they might've cleaned the lines for the beer recently, but it's the only place that I've gone. I remember often in the Valley where you think I might get stabbed tonight, or at least, you know, it's, it feels, there's times where it feels like, you know, the, the country Western bar in the blues brothers. Um, yeah, with the chicken wire. Exactly. With the chicken wire. But, uh, and the worst thing I ever, um, there's, you know, you know, the musician, Robert Cray, Right. Yeah, of course, yeah. All right, so he lives here, and his wife, um, lovely, lovely British former model, uh, this wonderful woman, Sue. She's like, we're gonna get together. We're gonna start, you know, doing events. She's like, let's do a disco dance fundraiser, and uh, it was a bunch of girls. We're gonna do it at the Maverick, and um, oh, she, she actually said, let's do a disco dance fundraiser at the Maverick, and um, <laughs> and I thought, and my wife was part of her little crew, and she's like, you want to come? I'm like, I fucking love to dance. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to curse. Um, oh, no, I loved. Right. Okay, great. Um, I love to dance. And I was like, you know, but I, I thought we'd have the place to ourselves. But no, the regulars just sort of moved, moved into the bar and there were little windows where they're peering through. So it didn't, it didn't go well. And my worm wasn't as impressive to the regular crowd as one might have assumed. Because I, I won my wife's heart with the worm um, almost 18 years ago. And, no pun uh, intended. 
No, hey, <laughs> boom, Jim, man, you are, you are in here, exactly. An 18-year <laughs> marriage in the, in the arts is a long time. And now your wife's an actress as well, is she not? She is, and she's, she's, she's the more talented uh, member of the crew, uh, of the duo. Um, and that was part of the reason we moved back to Toronto, because she had an amazing career up there. In fact, the place where I first did The Worm for her, we just, we'd been together like three months, and she was nominated for a Gemini, which is the Canadian uh, Emmy Awards, at which she won the first time at, at 16 or whatever. And so wow. we went and we, and we went to the disco party. And, you know, the Canadians, as we always say, they're 15% nicer, right? Yes. But they're also a little more, you know, 15% <laughs> more reserved. So now my wife is an American. She's from Ohio and moved up to Toronto as, as a teenager. But, you know, we broke out. We just went crazy, man. We have a dance floor. I broke out the worm. And I think that sealed the deal. As, as The second worm, as you pointed out so well, Jim. The, you know, <laughs> the, not the uh, first one. The I've, first. I've never had a bad time in Canada. I mean, ever. No. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Toronto, many times. Right. Unfortunately, the touring that I, the touring style that I've done the last over 20 years is we'll get to Toronto and sometimes I'll only be there for 18 hours, which is not enough right. time it's, to enjoy the culture fun. and go shopping and, you know, all that. And, you know, really for me, because I was on a series, I did Designated Survivor up there a couple of years ago for a few years. And, you know, the way our business has changed, you know, just like yours, I, I often, I go in, I get in there, I fly from here, I get in there in the middle of the night, I'd work all day the next day and I'd be out the next morning. I wouldn't get a chance to do anything. The best part, really right now working, the best part about COVID and quarantining and, you know, the massive COVID tests and all of the new regulations is they have to fly you in many days earlier, you know, um, because in the old days when there was a lot of money back when we did Memphis Bell, when yeah. they would take, when they'd fly 10 crazy Americans over to England for four months and put us up in amazing townhouses, they, there was a lot of time, but now, you know, the, everyone's penny pinching in the, um, the schedules have gotten much shorter. So you very rarely, you get into your hotel and you work the next day as opposed to having a day to sort of uh, acclimate, which is something I would prefer. But now, now you get four days to acclimate. I mean, you get a couple of swabs up the nose, but otherwise it's all really good. Yeah, my, my friend Ray Garcia is like, you may have even worked with him over the years. We went to high school together. He was, right. was a drummer and then he got into, became a key grip and he right. has literally worked with like everyone from, you know, McConaughey to De Niro to, jo I mean, and he's like, he just did Macbeth, I guess, with Francis McDormand. And he yes. said that he had to get 32 brain oh, yeah. sticklers in a oh, row because yeah. they do a brain tickler every morning. Oh, yeah. I've lost, I've lost count because I think I've been getting them now since the beginning of August. And I remember my first one, I was really trepidatious. Right? I was nervous. And, yes. and I, went, I, would, they, I landed in New Orleans. And they take me right from the airport to the clinic. And this very lovely woman comes out. And I, was, and, and I just, I'd had a bad experience once where a camera was sent down my nose and through the back and through my sinuses. And I just never really recovered from that. And uh, I said, oh, be gentle. And she's like, oh, will, baby. And she was super gentle. It was good. It was really nice. And now I've had all levels. I've had the nurse ratchet level where it's really, I'm like, you're, you're lying. You're in there for a very long time and you're going much deeper than the other people. And, uh, but I had a lovely one. I had a lovely one yesterday morning. She was wonderful. I, I called it a, a soothing nose massage. It was, uh, so now I feel like I'm almost a connoisseur of, oh, of nasal COVID swabbing. Tests. Yeah, of COVID tests. Yeah. You know, it's speaking of, 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 uh, of Canadian um, actors, how about that Shit's Creek? They Hell swept yeah. it every award for the, the first time in the history of the Emmys. And I just, I mean, I just felt for him, like the father and son dynamic. And yeah. it was great. Well, Christopher Guest dynamic, man. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, and I'm a, S, I'm a Second City TV, SCTV fan from way back. And, you know, so Eugene Levy's like, and Catherine O'Hara are gods to me and my yes. family. And, um, and up there, I mean, you know, but that shit's Creek thing was it was big time. The CN Tower, the largest freestanding structure in North America, was lit up in gold to uh, emulate an Emmy in honor of their win. Because, you know, the other thing wow. in Canada, they take a lot of pride in their uh, hometown kids. So, but yeah, Eugene Levy, I remember seeing him once when I first was courting my wife in Toronto and I was just overcome. You just see that, those eyebrows and that hair. I mean, that guy's a genius. Yes. And obviously he's, he, he was able to pass on the genius DNA too. So, which is, uh, you, know, you don't know if that's going to happen. That's not a guarantee. Hey, I see a gold record behind you. Go yes. Rex. So, so my, my buddy here, so I'm a little frazzled. We got on here because I had to go. My, my buddy just bought a 1969 like Shelby Barracuda, right? Uh, not Barracuda, um, Cobra. Cobra. So it got delivered um, from Utah and it just broke down. I go, I got to do this podcast at three, but um, we went to get, it. but this is, um, so Andy Haynes, my friend who I'm staying with here, that's a gold record given to him, I think when he was a guitar tech. So he started out as a guitar oh, wow. tech 
Yeah, with all these great bands in the late 70s and the 80s in England. He's a Cockney guy. And um, I mean, he, t- he was the backline guy for Pill and lots of, lots of different big bands of the time. And then, so that's Primal Scream. So obviously he did their line for a while and they gave him one. And then he was the backline guy for the Soup Dragons. And then I guess you know, when the lead singer got rid of the whole, the crew, he ended up becoming the bass player in the band for like the last wow. year they were all together. So yeah, so uh, he's got a nice selection of guitar guitars in here too, which um, um, I always try to, we, the only thing is we, we have a hard time jamming because we have completely opposite musical tastes. So you so play have, guitar. I play. I, I, yeah. uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, I'm a, a fan. I love playing. I've had a few bands. I wouldn't say I'm particularly very good, but um, that's why I was like, I was saying to you, I, I went down the rabbit hole just watching you just track things in the studio in Nashville. And I was just like, I'm such a nerd for that. And it was, I mean, you're, you're a monster. Well, thank I feel you like so I should much. be interviewing you. No, really. the, th- the thing reaction. about our, our crafts is, is you're like, you know, it's, it's like a hit it and quit it type of, you know, the budgets are down. And even yeah. though I feel like this is the, the, the glorious golden age of television with 500 shows yeah. being shot. It's like, what a wonderful time to be an actor. Um, it just, I don't know. I might have that wrong. I, I know that there's a lot more people that are wanting to do it, but there's also a lot of platforms. There are a lot of platforms. I mean, I see, you know, you, I was, you've been really smart in knowing to keep all the revenue streams open, right? So you're yeah. doing, you're doing so much stuff. And I think that's, if you can multitask and have a bunch of things to do, I think this is the time to do it. I mean, it was, there were, there was, I mean, obviously the, the music industry got hit a lot harder, I feel in so many ways than the acting industry, right? Obviously. And, um, and certainly, you know, when you can't make money from album sales, really, you can only make money from touring and that's gotta be tough for guys who don't have publishing, obviously. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, so if you write songs, that's the place to be, which it always was, but now more than ever. Yeah. And then, um, but yeah, acting, I mean, it's, it is a great time. Uh, um, it's not, a, it's not as lucrative as it was per se in the yeah. past. Right. But like the opportunities are amazing. And, and for so much quality television now with all of, with, with the Amazons and with the Netflix and their ilk, it's, it has been an amazing time. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I've really, I've been very fortunate. I got new, I'm working with an amazing woman and we sort of switched things up like three years ago because I was doing a lot of lucrative TV, but it wasn't really stuff that I wanted anyone to watch. At any point, mm-hmm. I was like, they'd be like, what are you doing? I'm like, yeah, it's fine. You know, it's, you, you, don't, don't worry about you it. You mean like the, like the guest star things on the episodes? Well, just even, I, even shows that I was recurring or leads on, they were, they were, they were good, but they weren't necessarily as, um, I don't know, as meaty, um, but they, they paid the bills. And then I sort of made a concerted effort to do stuff that I was proud of in the last few years. And I've been lucky enough that that's happened. So I've done a lot of stuff on Netflix. I'm working on Amazon right now. Just, I'm on my second show for Amazon right now, this in the last few months. So it's been really cool. And um, it's interesting because right now I'm working on Bosch and there's a lot of homicide uh, overlap there. So yeah. the creator of that show along with Michael Connolly was, you know, one of our main writers on homicide and the directors or guys was the DP on homicide. So it's, it's nice to be back in that world and also be able to say, fuck, um, that's the highlight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, homicide, you know, homicide was sort of the, the waning days of doing a co- of doing um, landmark TV on the networks because HBO hadn't really quite, it was about to take off. The Sopranos was about to happen, but really sure. you're still trying to do, you know, great cutting edge TV, which I, and I feel like the last network show that sort of hit that was West Wing probably. Mm-hmm. Right? And but Homicide, so we were doing this gritty, gritty cop show on the streets of Baltimore. Everything shot on location. We'd shoot in the real crack houses. You know, every time we'd fire fake guns, you'd hear the real ones in reply. <laughs> off the distance, right? but, but you couldn't say, you couldn't say any of the words that those cops would say. So, you know, you had to be creative. And gosh yeah. darn it. Yeah, gosh darn it. Oh, you, 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 you Gee, you could always, could always say son of a bitch so many times. Son of a bitch. It but just say cricket. Says, yeah. Right? <laughs> what did you say? What, Jiminy, was, cricket. Jiminy cricket. <laughs> Thor's hammer. Yeah. <laughs> there would never have been a wire though, right? Without Lama. Yeah. And, and so, and, and the, because the creator of The Wire, uh, you know, David Simon, he wrote the book. He followed the real homicide crew for a year in Baltimore. He wrote the book that the homicide was based on. And he was a writer, obviously, on the show and a creator on the show. And then he went off and basically did his, the full version in The Wire, which I still is my favorite drama of all time. And it was like the perfect realization of that genre and those stories. Um, and still shot, on, you know, on the mean streets of Baltimore, which are, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Wow. Speaking so of Mean Streets of Baltimore, Jim, I heard you're from Dan. <laughs> you're from Danbury, Connecticut. Yes, Danbury. Yes. Dan, I know. I know it well because I, I think at this time of the year, I, you, I heard you talking about it yesterday, and that would be when the Danbury Fair is, right? Danbury Fair. Yeah, that ended in uh, 1981. Did it? Oh, so quarter. it ended. Wow. Yeah. Oh, because I used to. Okay, so that shows. In my youth, because my grandparents lived in Southbury. Yeah. And we would go down to Danbury to the fair. That's where I'd get cider, and they'd have like they'd have the fun house and the haunted house. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it I was, think one of the I, there was like a in the in the beginning of the Sopranos. Okay. One of the. Um, statues was like a lumberjack at the Danbury Fair. And right. I want to say it got transferred to a place in either New York, New Jersey, and sure. I believe it ended up in the intro with Sopranos. You can actually see it. Okay, so that's, okay, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, and that Danbury. was at the first mall I went to. There was a mall in Danbury. Danbury Fair, in, that's what replaced the uh, the fair. Yeah, well, there you that's go. That's crazy. Okay. So Danbury I must have known that. Mall. Yeah, and Jim and I are Canisians. We're from, I'm from yeah. Milford, Connecticut. So oh, of course. Lot, there's okay. a lot of berries and Fords yeah. in Connecticut. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I so just, you're, I would, go ahead, you're kind of a New England, not a New England guy, but you're you're a New York guy. You're from Brooklyn, right? Well, I'm, I mean, I was born in Brooklyn. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I grew up in Manhattan. I mean, it's funny because my parents, I think they, they were living in Manhattan. They were living in the city and then they got pregnant. They're like, hey, I think we need to move somewhere more um, bucolic. And they're like, let's go out to the beach. So they moved to Manhattan Beach, uh, Brooklyn, which is a, an Orthodox Jewish community right next to Brighton Beach. Um, and uh, I think they only were allowed in because the, our last name is Diamond and we're the only Gentiles with the name Diamond on planet Earth. <laughs> and but when they moved in, I, I think I think the land the landlady, I, I, this is Lore, but she was like, I'm going to let you live here because your last name is Diamond, but you can't hang a wreath on the door or anything like that. So we lived there for about a year and uh, and then we moved and then to Manhattan where I grew up in the, you know, the 70s and early 80s there but yeah. I spent a lot of time in Connecticut all my because we didn't have much money and my grandparents lived in Connecticut and uh, so every vacation and most weekends I'd be up there and run around Canada the woods uh, of course know it well yeah. and then I'd right. follow and my grandparents were they were, I would go to Waterbury and Danbury because they were in the bowling league so we would those were where the two big bowling alleys were and, 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 then, and then, then we started going farther north because they got into curling late in life, which is very exciting. <laughs> That's a crazy so, sport. <laughs> it's Milford, a, the uh, curling capital of the world. I thought it was, was Milf you? Milford High Lie. We had High Lie, which is... Oh, uh, my God. Yeah. Right? Yes. High like, yeah. the, those commercials played constantly. Milford yeah. High Lie. Seeing those guys jump oh, around with the... Crazy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What about Crazy Eddie? Remember Crazy Eddie? Did you... Did you yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. His prices, prices are, are so insane. 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 Of course. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I have a funny story about Candlewood Lake um, yeah. because now it's kind of known as Candlewood Tepid Pond that, that <laughs> basically attracts mosquitoes. And uh, my <laughs> wife, we, I was working in radio at the time right. and a buddy of mine had a boat. So we, we would go do our shifts and go out in the boat and everything. And my wife and I were dating at the time and I, uh, I pushed her, you know, jokingly into the water. <clears throat> right. And she, you know, fully clothed and everything. She comes out. Next oh. day, she gets a she gets whacked with a double ear infection. <laughs> Ouch, Jim. <laughs> but she married you. That's Candlewood Lake for you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Think how many infections we got back in the day. We didn't know how dirty the water was. Oh, Man, you're like, we're, I mean, we're men of a certain age. I mean, like, yeah. we we ran with scissors. Our parents puffed cigarette smoke in our face. We, oh, yeah. We, no seatbelts. Yeah, there was like we had no. We played outside. We didn't have no. cell phones or text messaging. No. We used. My father was a big fisherman, so we used to fish on Candlewood Lake. We don't, I don't think right. we ever ate the fish, but we would go deep sea fishing off of Point Judith. You ever go out to Rhode Island area and all that stuff? Sure, right? sure, of course. Like Narragansett yeah. in that yeah. area. So when I was probably six, seven, eight years old. He would take his 19-foot bow rider boat, okay, a little lake boat, and we would take it out Point Judith Jetty right. into the Block Island Sound, where, mind you, the Long Island, the Block Island, and the Atlantic Ocean, you know, bodies of water converge. I kid you not, it was like a scene from freaking, you know, Deadliest Catch. You know, oh, 100%. Like wave. But, man, when you're seven years old, it's a blast, yeah, and you trust like, your dad. Of, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. But yeah, of it's course, one of things yeah. I look back on. Holy crap. I mean, CPS would have taken us in a mo in a heartbeat. Yeah. In a heartbeat. And it's something you would never do with your own kids, but you're glad you did it. <laughs> My business partner, he goes, You had a single engine on the boat? I was like, Yeah. He goes, <gasps> You didn't even have redundancy with two engines? I go, No, I didn't think of it. Is that a bad thing? <laughs> 
it's uh, we climbed trees. I had a banana oh, bike. Oh, yeah. I had the shortboard skateboard. Oh, we, oh, yeah. we, I pretended I was in Kiss. I I thought I thought I was Luke Skywalker, and we, oh, yeah. we just we had imaginations. Oh my God! Pretended I was my best friend and I, Jack Wagon Seller. We would spend every summer. My family would go down to Ocean City, New Jersey, down the southern southern oh. Jersey, and probably between I guess between like eighth grade and ninth grade, whatever. I didn't want to, I, I, didn't, I wasn't into like going to the beach. We just wanted to play Kiss so, in his room. So for an entire summer, also because he was the only guy that had air conditioning, but he was my best friend. We played that double platinum album, start to finish, yes. with tennis rackets. I got all the Gene songs. He would do all the Paul songs for the lead vocals. Then we'd, you know, do a toss up for Ace or a Peter Chris song. <laughs> but that was the best summer of my life. We still talk about it. I finally, you know, we finally reconnected. Thank God, Facebook. But you're just like, yeah. Call me Dr. Love. They call we, me Dr. Love. We just pretended. And I would get these yeah. dirt bombs and we would throw the dirt bombs for the snow yeah. explosions and everything. Yeah. It that was, was my first concert was Kiss. I I Ma Madison Square Garden. What's that? I don't think I did any of that. Really? <laughs> smoke bomb. The smoke bomb thing is uh, it's kind of inventive. I, I, uh, yeah. I did you there. It is really good. That's a good one. That is that's really good. What did you do? Like, did you do blood? Uh, no, we didn't have blood. No. Yeah, no, yeah, no. yeah, 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 yeah. That was getting a little carried. We had a little carried away yeah. there, but uh. we did a we did a rendition of Panama at uh, at one of the camps, the day camp I attended. Did you you played it? You played it though for but real. I played the Eddie yeah. part. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And see, Jim is a real drummer. Like he got into radio and he got into he's a professional voiceover artist. He's a Renaissance man, but he still plays drums. But he just doesn't have to um, feed his family uh, with backbeats, <laughs> which is yeah. you know there's less stress. <laughs> I, I learned from rich so less stress well you know what when we we're just talking about living yeah. and gr growing up in manhattan you got your education at juilliard and while am i, am I correct there you went to juilliard yeah, you're school? absolutely correct yeah, so yeah, yeah. Absolutely. so you're paying to your way through juilliard and your first job at 21 is this film that becomes iconic that's celebrating 30 years memphis bell and your fellow cast members are guys like Eric Stoltz and D.B. Sweeney and Billy Zane and Sean Astin and Harry Connick Jr. and John Lithgow. Yeah, man. Matthew Modine. And yeah. And so like here you are it kind of like setting the highest bar. And am I right in saying that you, once you leave Juilliard, you've got this notch in your bedpost. You didn't have to go do Topol smoker, Smokers commercials or... <laughs> Where you, you didn't have to do commercials, man. Crazy you were commercial. Well, I did because I. That's where I. I. I started that way because I started acting while I was in high school. Because the beauty of going to of being in Manhattan is we. I, I had a, my the high school I went to did amazing productions. So it was probably the best. It was the best experience I've ever had in the theater. And so actual managers and agents would come to your shows. Wow. So when I was like sixteen, my first manager saw me doing the Diary of Anne Frank, and. <laughs> I went and met them the next morning. That afternoon, I went to my first commercial audition, and I got that commercial. And uh, so, and I thought, and I thought it would always be like that, which was a huge mistake. Um, it uh, and it, and then I did commercial. I paid so I paid for college. I paid for the first two years of Juilliard doing commercials. So I did. I mean, the first one I did. But you remember too, like now, obviously the economics of that have changed, but they used to run for years. I mean, the first, oh, yeah. the first commercial I did, my first commercial was for Panasonic and they had some, you know, basically their version of a Walkman. And it was like, it was a cool edgy, they had a cool edgy song, let the music move you. You know, it was like, and they're like all these people who were like getting, we were in a barbershop and they were all getting like super crazy punk haircuts. And I'm like really straight because I played the preppy guy for a long time. And I'd be all, I'd be all weirded out by then. I'd let the music move me. And I started dancing out of the, um, uh, out of the, doing the worm and and you know exactly pre-worm yeah i'm show, showing them my worm. <laughs> and do you and do you know where that com when that commercial premiered when during live aid oh wow right Ching. so you know so i'm i'm of course watching every single single second of live aid not knowing that the commercial is going to premiere during that thing but i'm 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 watching it you know start to finish right you know nose to tail and there it comes so it was great and it ran for a few years and uh you know that that paid for because i was i went to regular college for a little while just because i wanted to um drink and hang out with chicks and, and that was that was db's uh business model was like he's my you know i just kind of want to not go to college and drink and party and acting seemed like there was like a lot of girls it wasn't too hard yeah they like it yes. Well, that was the thing too. You know, growing up in Manhattan, which was probably beneficial for my career, is like no one, no one went to the watch. You know, watch the lacrosse team play or the soccer team play. You weren't going to really meet girls from other schools um, by doing those things. But 
all of the girls from all over town would come to the place. So it was, it was nice. magic. They'd see you at your best being silly and creative. Right. So no, I mean, that was definitely, it was certainly, I mean, I, I loved it, but that was a, a and, and uh, that was definitely a motivation. But then, yeah, then I went to, I went to Chapel Hill for a couple of years because it, mm-hmm. um, just, I wanted to have a college experience, but I was still doing, I was acting during the summer and then I got into Juilliard. And in fact, the first day of like orientation, I had to miss it because I got this commercial, uh, a Subaru commercial. And they were, they brought me in the office. Like, we don't really, you know, you're not allowed to miss school and we're not really happy about this. I was like, I got to do it. You know, cause also I, I was paying for school. My parents weren't paying for school. And that commercial ran for two years. It paid for the first two years of Juilliard, which was amazing. And those then, are all but, union commercials. They're all yeah. non-union now, which is... Well, of course, everything's non-union. You know, it's like, I mean, now, you know, they've seen what they can get away with, right? I mean, you're getting, you, I mean, you're at a point in your career where you're just getting straight offers or they're like, hey, just give us a little quick self-tape. We, we want you, but... I mean, it's competitive though. It's gotten, it, it's still, which is good in a way. It's actually because it's tightened in other ways. Like, you know, um, for my niche of, you know, middle-aged white guy, that's, that, that shrunk, right? That sort of those, I mean, luckily, I mean, thank God, you know, every time I watch the news, I'm like, oh, thank God there's a bunch of asshole white guys out there. At least that gives me job security. I've got parts to play because yeah. that's really, that's my bread and butter right now. The evil so. corporate leader. Yeah, douchey, scary CIA guy, whatever it is. Yeah, right now I'm playing. I'm playing succession of basically uh, douchey Bernie Madoff, uh, you know, Ponzi scheme, uh, horrible, or like, or, or, or you know, Sackler family, just just horrible, horrible, deliciously horrible white guys. Nice. But but you know the thing about auditioning is, yeah, there's a lot more. You have to now because it's got more. It's strangely, not strangely. That's stupid. It's just. The nest, you know, the business changed, right? You know, you yeah. gotta either you either like get on board or you get left behind because the train's still moving, and so it got a lot more competitive. But it's actually been in a weird way exciting. So I mean, now if I go into a room, when back when there were rooms, there won't be rooms anymore. But back in you know a year ago, everyone would be DB, be that you. I know every single person. I know every face in that room, and yeah. everyone's like slugging it out. Um, and I think the good part of that is you know it keeps your certainly keeps your chops up. Yeah. And, you know, you can't, I mean, yes, I'm very lucky things. I do get offered things all the time, but I still like, if I really want something, I'm probably gonna have to fight for it because it's a buyer's market out there. And also now as you, you just, you know, so I know you're an actor, so you know this well, the self tape thing has changed everything. Right. Mm-hmm. So because they can just order you up like a pizza and it doesn't, they don't have to get a room and, and there's like, yeah, put yourself on tape, put yourself on tape. And it always feels oftentimes like, I don't know if you experienced this, but you're yeah, like, yeah. Hope, hope, hope someone's fucking looking at it. Right. Yeah, I, I hope they actually open the file because I have toiled over this because now you're the DP, you're the producer, oh, yeah. you're the lighting guy. And, and, and they say, don't put too much money or effort into it. Just stand against a blank wall no, are you kidding me? I'm wearing a lapel mic. I've got lights. I've got, because if it sets your performance apart in some way. And then the other thing that I've noticed is like, I know that you like to go in the room. And when you go in the room, they say, make sure you have your sides. You don't have to look at them, but you can get away with glancing down. It's, it's, it's part of the experience. They expect that, right? Exactly. Now, yeah, yeah. You yeah. gotta be off book because even if you just go to catch, you're, <clears throat> you're out of it. And they, you're out of it. yeah. Yeah, no, you're you're 100 percent right, and it's funny because I watched some, I don't know, I was you know trying, you know, I was I'm going down some YouTube rabbit hole during lockdown. There was some SAG had some seminar where their casting director was like, "No, you should have your sides during your self tape." I'm like, "That's not true. That's no one. It's not going to work." Speaking of which, though, so my wife, as we were talking about, she she retired for 12 years, top of her career, retired, so we could she could be you know with our daughter and home. Like a month ago, she's back in Toronto. Which was one of the reasons we went up there. She didn't do anything. The, her uh, old friend, who's, like, uh, who's a big casting director there, said, oh, are you back? I, wanna, I want you to audition for something. She's like, sure, <laughs> she'll put yourself on the tape. She, put, she, she gets it. Then she gets an agent. She gets the first audition. She just started auditioning 10 days ago. She, because this is why, you know, I'm, you know, hopefully I can be the, the purse holder now. But she, she got her first damn audition. But she had to do all of this. And I'm here. I'm reading. She's FaceTiming me. I'm reading off camera for her. So, because we always, because we're separated by two and a half thousand, you know, two and a half thousand miles, yeah. but uh, she's killing it. But yeah, she's got the whole thing down. She's got her whole lighting set up, but she's, she's figured out how to do the whole thing by herself and, uh, and still, you know, be a mom, but yeah, but it's, it's, it's really changed. I mean, but I think the exciting part, you know, because you always have to find, you, you can complain about it and get left behind, but the exciting part is that you can control it. I mean, that's, it's the dual edged sword, right? Because if you do it, 
if you do 19 takes and you're just, it's going to be diminishing returns or if, I mean, but I feel you have to set up certain boundaries, but it's, I think it's the same thing thinking about music production. Sure. You know, when I, when I started, I started, and you know this a billion times better than I did. Um, now with all of this software and all of these plugins, you can A, B yourself to death, right? Oh, you're yeah. like, let me try it through that amp. Let me try it through that amp with the flanger. Let me try, you know, and you're just like, and, and you know, the beauty of A, having a band in the old days of recording is like, fucking lay it down, which is cool when I was watching you, lay, the things I was, saw, saw you, you were all in the room and you're all laying it down yeah, together. We, we still do that in Nashville, which is amazing. Well, it's the only, it's the best because, I mean, I mean, you guys are, I mean, you guys are, <laughs> You guys are so good. You're so good because you're. Well, we just been together for 20 years. It's just it's easy, you know. No, but that's the Rich, best way. To, you guys are, are really good. Okay, just, you're, just, you're amazing. Oh, shucks. Yeah, but it feels good, and you have that communication. So that's so that's exciting. Um, and then you're you're going to create better because you're going to groove off of each other. You're going to feed off each other. Sure. And so so that's the same thing with these auditions. I feel like you can't can't get too far up your own ass. And yeah. like, I got you to set myself a limit. I go, I don't want to go. I don't want to go above three, three takes. And so my girlfriend it. reads with me and I've got yeah. the lapel mic. And then yeah. the, one of the challenges that I've found is just creating eye lines. So if she's reading for three different characters, you've got to almost envision the space. It'd be like, mm. that's one character. That's another character. And that's another character, but it's still coming from her one voice as a reader reading three yeah. parts. Right. So that's yeah. a challenge sometimes, but Anyway, it's just, you know, continuing education here. But I know, I just love the, the fact that you are a, a classically, classically trained actor. Our mm. sponsor of our show, Reed, is the School of Rock. I don't know if you have any oh experience gosh. with the School of Rock, but it's an amazing organization. And, I wish it uh, existed when I was a kid. I would have. Jim and I, I say the same thing, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, we were talking about, yeah, I mean, School of Rock. I want to go to School of Rock. I want to have access access to the gear. I want yeah. to be able to play. I want to have smart, cool rock guys teach me how to play. Well, when this opens all up, you kidding me? They would love to have you because you're in, you know, actors that rock. It ends up being just a great thing because people just revere actors. It's just a fun thing because you have been plucked from the masses to shine brightly on this silver screen and invade our living rooms. And it's just a really cool thing. So you're like EF Hutton. Like when you talk, people listen. <laughs> So if you, you know what I mean? So if you go in with your guitar and you jam with the kids, they love you. But here in Nashville, we got two coming up on three locations. Our friends, Angie and Kelly McCray, they run a tight ship and they are cranking out amazing musicians, drummers, bass players, guitar players, keyboard players, kids working together to be in a team. They learn life skills like showing up on time, oh, yeah. finishing tasks, working as part of an ensemble. Jim, if the parents out there want to get their kids involved with the school rock, what do they do? Go to Franklin at schoolofrock.com or Nashville at schoolofrock.com and possibly to soon to be coming Mount, uh, Juliet? Mount Juliet. Yeah, I think they're breaking oh, ground yeah. out there. So. Heck yeah. Yeah, breaking it with their axes. And I mean that, yeah. <laughs> Get a flying V, just break the ground. <laughs> Crushing Woo! ants with your, yeah. with, your, with your axe. Oh well, with the monsters of rock. No, that's, that's, that's so cool. Oh, man. I love so, that. But Reed, so culturally, what's the difference between an American actor and a Canadian actor as far as like workflow, work ethic, attitude? Like, how does it all work? Is, are they still pulling 15, 18 hour days up there? Less, less uh, American actors say A a lot less. Oh uh, yeah. Well, you know, I, I really, um, I, this is a, this is a very, I, I, I can't even walk into this question because this is my new home, but I will tell you one, I'll tell you a funny story. No, they're great up there. I mean, I work up there all the time. I work in Vancouver. I work yeah. in Toronto. I mean, I think, I certainly think that my, there's so much American production up there. And I certainly think oh, yeah. my wife, you know, she worked all the time because she was an American and she understood the accent, but no, there's so many great actors up there and they're friends. But, um, I remember working, I did a, I did a TV movie with, um, uh, this was uh, God, with Brian Dennehy. He's like 1997. He plays my dad, and I guess he's 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 it's, you know it's horrible. back in the day of TV movies. And I did so many of those. I worked with, you know I did one with Tori Spelling. I did them all, but they were great yeah. because especially on Homicide, I wasn't getting paid very well because it was a boutique show. So over the summer, you could do one of these TV movies, and you could kind of make your nut for the year doing one of these things. Right. But I always want to work with Brian Dennehy, and it was great. But blah blah blah. So he in the story he rapes this you know the family friend and i'm and i'm now now i end up because i'm also a lawyer he's a lawyer i'm a lawyer i represent her but i'm sitting with her son and she's like um i can't remember my name was like let's just say my name is jim is my mom a whore 
And, uh, and you know, as a Canadian, my mom a whore. And I was like, no, is, is it Jim? Is my mom a whore? But uh, that's, so that's this like, you know, you got the, you know, that, that sound. Oh, yeah. Okay. Can you, can you go uh, back yeah. into the house? Oh yeah, you know, but uh, just give her a, but uh, it's, it's a good one. It's a good accent, but I've now taken as many things, you'll know, take on as sort of like a comic affectation. Now it's become part of my regular speech because we love to do Bob and Bob and Doug. Um, we have Bob and Doug action figures. When we knew we were moving out there, we got them from my daughter and she's, she's one of the few 11 year olds I know who've seen every single second city or SCTV back, you know, like twice through. Um, but we like to do it, eh? You know, cause you're going to Tim Ho's, you get your Tim, you know, your Timmy Ho's. Oh yeah. Go exactly. to Timmy Ho's. Yeah. Get good a double, chili, double. Good chili, yeah. right? Oh, you know, it's cold. Chili, take yeah. off, eh? oh, I'll take off your hoser. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We know that. But, uh, yeah. So no, the Canadian, now Canada's a great place to work. And like I say, yeah. 15% nicer than America. So that's, you know, you have that 15% more polite. Like, I mean, you can go anywhere in America from New York and, and the Northeast and get 15% nicer anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, we, there's, there's a lot of nice people. I just, you know, we're just, we're just, we're and, but just I mean, it's like New York area is like the armpit of the country. And, and, you know, I, I could say that cause I grew up there for 25 years and, uh, you know, they they think they're the most civilized people, but yet they're some of the most uncivilized people. Ouch. Oh, I, might, I might give you some pushback on that because my view <laughs> of New Yorkers, my view having as a native New Yorker, I mean, things have changed. I don't really recognize the city anymore, but in, it's, it's different than when, when I was growing up, when you guys were growing up, but they're just efficient. And the one thing they detest is inefficiency, right? And that's what makes them fucking crazy. And that's like, you know, my favorite part about Canada, and, and I'm going to let my secret out, is they, they love a fucking line. They will stand on a line. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm going to start another line because that's what you do in New York. Like, I don't know. That's, there's an area over here. I have, a, I have a better access to the shopkeeper. I'm getting on this line. And then yeah. it works. So, you know, I feel it's weird because now when I go back to New York, I can't keep up. So I feel like it's, I feel it's a good skill skill that benefits me elsewhere in the world, but not back in New York City. I was just back there shooting, was shooting billions like two years ago. And I go, oh, I could drop dead on the street right now. People just walk the fuck over me. Like I'm, yeah. it doesn't oh, matter, yeah. right? Right. So, um, uh, so, I, but, it, but what I, they like efficiency and they're very kind, you know, I mean, I feel like you, you, you try to ask for directions on the streets of Paris, you may not get them, but on New oh, York you're not They'll tell yeah. you. They'll have to tell you. You go here. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they just, they're efficient. They don't have a lot of time. Like, they need you to get it right away. You got to get it right away. And they're moving on because they got places to be, the thing to do. Um, <laughs> that's a good energy, right? But uh, so that's, but, but I, I hear what you're saying. It's nice. We took, we took our kids to New York yes. uh, about two years ago. Right. Uh, and showed them our old stomping grounds up in Connecticut and everything. Right. And we spent three days in New York City. And uh, I would go out of my way to mm -hmm. look people in the eye on the sidewalk. Oh my oh. gosh, did they get unsettled? It was hilarious. <laughs> oh yeah. I would just yeah, sit there yeah. and while they, I would look around there and they're, they're, they're sitting there like darting their eyes. They're going, what? and I'm, I'm just like <laughs> looking right at them as they stare at them. I'm just staring them down and they're just like, it's your problem. I'm like, oh, I'm saying, well. <laughs> and then I get to the, to the uh, corner and because I've been in Nashville for the past 15 years, right. I'm like, yeah. Hey, uh, how y'all get down to that world trade center? You, what, what, what I got to take here? What, can you tell me something about this world trade center? What, what, how do I get down there? Can you tell me? And they'd be like, Oh my God, this guy is from the sticks. Let's, you know, let's send him up to Harlem or something. <laughs> <laughs> but this the thing like, see, now you'll survive. You'll live if you do that. Yeah. I, I, Cause it's, it's such a different city and I haven't adjusted. Like my dad's still in the apartment that I grew up in. Um, yeah. But like I was on, cause now there's nowhere that's not safe. Like I was, I was taking the subway the other, sure. I remember my father, when I was a kid, my father was doing a play up on 125th street on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And we lived at the last express stop before 125th street. I remember my mom and I got on the train to go to his play. And I remember all these kindly African-American women go, Oh baby, you're on the wrong train. You're on the wrong train. And, and, and you're, cause no one was going up to 125th street. And now like that's, there's no, I was, I was, yeah. I was taking the local all the way up to Washington Heights. Everyone lives in Washington Heights. And I remember I'm on, I'm on a train car. I'm going to see a friend there and I'm sitting there and the train car is empty. The subway car is empty. And that usually back in the day, if you were alone in a subway car in 1979, shit, was going to go down and you weren't going to make it right whoa and then the doors open and then just walks this this german family and say oh this is great we're here the little kids are running around and it's wonderful and i was like oh wow everyone's safe i'm not because i 
it took me a long time to think like, I'm not, I'm going to get stabbed because I got mugged all the time. Right. Like, really? Stop. Oh my God. I mean, that's the thing, you know, you to go back to your earlier point. Yeah. My parents, I live in New York city. My parents like come back at dinner time and you'd be out and what the shit you got up to, you know, buying illegal fireworks from the Optimo stores, from the cigarette stores, you know, drinking and all the things you get into, but like got mugged gunpoint. I mean, I got mugged. I lost count of how many times I got mugged. And also to 70s parents, to your dad, taking you out in a boat that has one engine and Block <laughs> Island Sam. I think at most, if I got mugged, my, my father might take the time out of his schedule to walk me to school maybe, maybe the next day. But that was it. And you can you like, I'm here, my kid, like, you know, that's not, that's not going to happen. But it's funny, but, you know, I talked to a nurse once. We were, I was going to a kid's CPR class when, when, when our baby was about to be born. And she goes, all of you think you did all these things when you were young and it was just, you just, now we're too careful. She's like, you were just lucky. And she, lots of shit happened back then. It did happen. It did. But, uh, but we were lucky. Yeah. I mean, and I, I, I miss it. It's funny, you know, cause I was saying, I just went to fix my, help my guy. I can't fix it. I can't do anything with a car, but pick up my buddy whose old car broke down. When I first moved to Los Angeles, cause I grew up in New York city. I didn't even get my driver's license till I was 21. Cause there was, there was no point. Um, but when I moved to LA, the first car I bought, it was like a year after Memphis Bell or whatever. I bought a 64 Plymouth Valiant convertible push button transmission. Wow. That was my first car, right? Beautiful. Kept it forever. I go, oh, I'm going to give this to my kid, right? I'm going to keep it forever. So I kept it, kept it. And I had it when I first met my wife. And then we got pregnant or she got pregnant. Um, 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 I had a sympathy pregnancy, but no, when she got pregnant, I go, I'm getting rid of this car. There's no way I'd let my child drive this car. It's a death trap. <laughs> this is not reliable. My daughter is only driving in a brand new BMW or Audi or Volvo. I need, I need this thing to run, never break down. But, uh, you know, we were lucky, but it, it's romantic. I mean, even the romance of the city, you know, think about music. I mean, that, that the scene in the late 70s, the New York punk scene and the music scene was so exciting. And then the music scene in the 80s. And um, I loved it. I mean, it was really, you know, CBGBs couldn't have existed um, if that neighborhood was what it is today. And now, you know, it's now it's, just, it's a John Varvados, right? At least uh, yeah, he kept the building. Crazy? And I shot there. I, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty. I'm like, yeah, this was CBGBs, but I'm going mm -hmm. in for the great clothes. Well, no, I mean, and, and good for him. I mean, he's a fan and he cares about music. So I think he did a solid thing. But it was funny because I was there, I was staying at the Lower East Side. And now the Lower East Side, when I, in the 80s, when I went to the Lower East Side, you only went there for one reason. And we all know what that was. <laughs> to buy drugs and um and now like i go there and just on every street it's like it's it's the ultimate hipster neighborhood like, there's just a, just a restaurant that only serves meatballs and a bar that's only serves. oh and i go to that place every time reed and, I love, yes. <laughs> and, it, and it's like it's the shirts like got balls and it's like yeah. you go in, it's just all meatballs and meatballs bread and wine Exactly. And it's amazing. But, but I go, like my is, it's, it's no, it's, it's amazing. It's and, really I, and I can't even imagine who I would be if I grew up in that New York because yeah. where it's, where every, where the, it's beautiful and flush and there's restaurants. I mean, obviously things are going to change yeah. now. Unfortunately, the world's changing again, but, um, but yeah, so I, I romanticize our childhoods and it was great. But uh, yeah, your banana seat. You have yeah, to have man, it. I saw Star Wars in the theater. I saw Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. I saw I saw yeah. ET in the theater. Yeah. Jaws. Yeah. I yeah. will still won't go on the water. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. smart. Well, it's getting really bad because they're fighting back. They're uh, <laughs> they're the fighting. sharks. They're fighting yeah. back. Like here, they've had, enough. they've had enough. Like here, where I am in Santa Barbara County, they have a surf um, school right out here on Carp in Carpinteria. In the old days, they'd see like a shark a season. Now they see a great, you know, now you can't call them gray whites because they're called white sharks. White shark, you see, they see one a day. I saw yeah. one. I saw one in a wave as I was driving along the, the, the freeway uh, yeah. a couple of years ago. I was just going to see like. I mean, surfing seems like fun. It really does. Because I'll like boogie board or body yeah, board. You know? yeah, yeah. Just, but I'm still thinking to myself, I look like a seal. Yeah, you're you know? a seal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the only way they can find out is with a little taste test. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I'm hearing some of these sample. accents coming from you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you had a German accent in this one scene I saw in Agents of Shield, Marvel's yeah, Agents yeah, of yeah. Shield. Yeah. And so, do you get a dialect coach, or is that, or is it a thing where it's like to audition for the part must have a great German accent? No. So that, you know, because because the the timing in the business, as we talked about earlier, has changed so much. You will get the job 
the day before you have to be there. They'll call me up. So I remember, I remember with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. because my friends ran that show. It was the, Jed Whedon and Marissa, his wife, and, and, um, and I'd worked with them on Dollhouse and, and yeah. with Joss. And, and I knew they were going to offer me a part, but it, the deal hadn't closed. And until the deal closes, no one can talk about it. And ABC finally approved me and they call me up and, and they go, okay, it's like a Thursday, say, uh, you got the part. We've, we're so happy to have you. Okay, you're going to play this character. He has a German accent and I had to work like, the next day. And, but I think I didn't have to do, I didn't have to do the German accent until Monday. So I had the whole weekend, but so, I mean, I just was like, okay, great. So I just do a deep dive now, think to the interweb, do a deep dive on, you can get real people speaking German and I would get, uh, there's a whole database of, they have people read a certain speech and from wherever you find out where they were. Cause I sort of picked where he was from, but I said, I had to fake it. Um, I mean, I said to come up with it in a weekend and then they had the dialect coach on the day and then she was like, oh, that sounds perfect. So it was great. But um, yeah. I mean, some ones you collect cause you like them. Like when I did, when I did Memphis Bell, we hadn't. Before I went to England, I don't know why I was so naive because I, I should have known because I was a big UK punk fan. But I, I, I guess I was so um, I, I had been so misled by PBS that I pretty much thought when I went over there it was all going to be very posh people and it was going to be you know, upstairs downstairs. But but you know, when you work at, we were working at my favorite studio, Pinewood Studios, where they made the James Bond movies. I mean, wow. the studio I'd always dream of life of working at but the whole crew you know they're, they're cockneys right they're just you know they're all east end guys they all have those accents and so i was around them for four months and i came home with that accent came back to Juilliard, and and, uh, and got to use that when i did my own one and only broadway play i got to use that cockney accent so the ones you collect you know there's certain wow. ones that, that you love and you sort of play around with or i went to school in the south so you pick up a couple of the southern ones and then there's those sort of um the, the, and then there's the the holy grail ones or the white whale ones that you want to do like i really wish i could get which i can't get it's like a real good northern accent like put cake on table like a yorkshire like ah oh, put cake on table uh went down pub um it's like the ringo are, accent yeah well because he's scouts right so yeah because because right? he's got that he's got the liverpool um oh yeah me and john we went down to the you know, went to the pub and went to the cavern club but you know but they all but that's what i love about england it's like each little area has yeah. um its own thing and now staying with my buddy andy with the man of the gold records he's he's got all the lingo too because that's there's all these different words you know cockney has that rhyming slang mm -hmm. um where you say the second part of it or the first part of it and but he's taught me a ton of different ones like where, my favorite one is there's like a billion different words for getting drunk but my my new favorite one right now is he was steaming he was steaming so oh. steaming's a really good one yeah <laughs> let's get pissed let's get pissed yeah they all it all sounds better it all sounds better it sounds just like they're, i mean they yeah, obviously they're they, they invented the language they're really good with it they got a lot of use I for a, it i had a voiceover one time that that actually they wanted a british read and huh? what does we that had mean? a guy yeah. living with us who was right. british right. and he was hearing me in my my studio crank this thing out <laughs> And he's laughing his ass off. And I come out, I'm like, I know. And he's like, that was possibly the worst British <laughs> accent I have ever heard. I'm like, I can't do it. I said, but for some reason they like it. So I'm giving it to them. I mean, I just can't. I can do New York. I can do a bit of Southern. But when it comes to anything, you know, I, I lose the character. I once had, hey, can you do a Dracula? I'm like, yeah. The only thing is that if you like a German Russian Dracula, <laughs> That's what's going to come out over time when I read. We all like that script. guy. He's a great Dracula. That's yeah. the one. Yeah, that's uh, the Come down to it. Then eventually you're Americans. That's you're the best. Stupid Americans. Oh wow! Oh, he's like a, he's like a he's a vampire KGB yeah. agent. That's right. Which is, yeah, 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 exactly. it, that's what it turns into. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, you, you know, Reed, our, um, our our mutual friend uh, uh, Steve Cooper connected us, and you were yeah. on his uh, podcast and, and Cooper Talk, and that's actually me doing the voice. You're listening to Cooper Talk, he, <laughs> and and that's me playing the drums at the beginning of his show. So it's like this. Oh, is that's very, so cool! Everything in my life is relationships. Um, it is one hundred percent. He was. He was. Uh, you guys were talking about. Um, Voiceover. scene stealers where where you were like you know i mean you're such a, you've got such a great essence and a great personality and you're so high energy yes I'm, you know your enthusiasm i'm sure is contagious so people want to be around you they want to be at craft service with you they want you on set um but you were talking about these people that actors that will intentionally try to derail the other actor and downplay the other person's performance so they can shine brighter which is like yeah. i can't even imagine it because it seems to me it's like a team sport and you're both trying to get to the truth of the scene and bring out the best of each other but there really are those people that do that 
Yeah, of course. I mean, I think there's, you know, I think there's two schools of thought in life. Like, hey, we're all in this together. Or like, hey, you know, um, the worse you are, the better I am. And certainly I see that in my business. Now it's changed. It has changed a lot because I think that the economics of this business has weeded out a lot of assholes. And probably, you know, same in the music business. I mean, you guys are you're a fucking professional. I, mean, I see you in there. Like, you're here. I, I know you're getting the click in your ear and you're time, and you guys are just going. And no one has time for like, you, you, you I always love that. Who's the um, the cre- the bass player for Steely Dan with the crazy walrus mustache? Oh, um, yeah, we should know that. Was uh, uh, there's Walter Becker? He, 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 he and Becker then yeah, because he was a big studio bass. Oh, guy. Oh no, uh, there was uh, um, um, he played Lee with Sklar. Uh, um, yeah, yes, 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 yes exactly. Lee Sklar. and he's still at it. But he's talking about like, you know, back in the day, you know, they spent a month trying to find the right seat in the studio. And, you know, yeah. and you're just like, you know, you're, you're, built, you're building the mirror into the console just to do blow off of, right? But that's yeah. not the world anymore. So I think too, in, in acting, yeah, there were, I worked to some real fucking assholes. And, um, but they're, they're fewer and farther between now because there's no time for them and they won't get put up with. And it's interesting too, you know, I find even in just the Me Too stuff, um, uh, a lot of people, if you haven't done something, if you're a good person and maybe some accusation comes out, usually you don't, it doesn't get much air. Maybe it's, you know, maybe there's, it's, it's not, I don't want to say not accurate, but I'm saying, but, but some of these people, as soon as it gets out and the doors open to take them down because they were such tremendous assholes as well as just being just disgusting sexual predators. And then everyone's like, great, it's safe because, you know, we can take them down because that's the thing. People have power. I mean, I've encountered half those people who got brought down and they were fucking assholes and they were scary too. You know I mean? Um, uh, even some of them who've won down, you know, made moves on a 16 year old Reed Diamond, you know? So it's like, it's, it's, but, but the scene stealer, that's an, that's an interesting one because if you're playing, if we're, <laughs> because I do believe, you know, cause I come from the theater and I also like, I do, I'm an improv, uh, imp- improv comedian. So, you know, we're always, you work in groups, right? So you're, I'm only as good as you, you know, this yeah. interview, I don't know what it's going to be like. Cause I'm only as interesting as you, you know, as you, we bounce off each other, you know? So, and I, and I knew, you know, we were going to have a great time. So yeah. I don't plan, I don't come loaded with stories. There's no, we're just going to talk and we're going to find some stuff, but that's because we, you know, we're working together. We're all just, we want to make this, we want to make this incredible podcast the best it can possibly be. Sure. But then there's Which some people, you know, but then there's people, you know, who are going to, it is, it's the fucking best. This, and, you know, don't it's tell the best anyone. podcast you've ever So much better than Cooper's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hope you no, 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 he will. I, I, I love what you're saying. And it's funny yeah. because, you know, uh, as Rich will probably attest that I'm a huge right. Marvel fan with a, yeah, yeah, yeah. the gauntlet that I have in the back of me. And right. uh, my family really kind of uh, knows me and that's why they got that mm. for my birthday. Yeah. Uh, of course I, I asked for it. So the, um, Love it, it, it's funny you talk about that because you're, you're, cause Rich talked about that in your, uh, in Rich's movie that we made uh, where you had other musicians. You, you said it was vibing people out of the studio, right, Rich? I mean, that, that happens. Oh, yeah. John, it happened yeah. to you several times. Yeah, Jim filmed a very guerrilla-style week in the life of a working musician about a decade yeah. ago, oh, and he yes. followed me around with a camera. And, yeah. Um, yeah, it's called vibing people out. And it's like, I oh, know, yeah. you know, energy <clears throat> and enthusiasm and positivity are... Attitude. Attitude. It's, they're paramount and people yeah. always remember that, you know, and if I'm assuming that if you're a positive person and you show up on time and you know your lines and you're able to take direction, you're 95% ahead of other actors. Yeah, you are, but at an attitude's everything, but you, you know, you just pointed up something really cool with this vibing thing. Cause I think about that, you know, if you're playing, if you're in the studio and you're with these, you, these killers, you, you, you studio killers and someone comes in, he's a little nervous. If you have two choices to make in that moment. It's the same thing on set. You can either like, hey, buddy, we got you, man. We're all in this together. Because I see it all the time with actors. And I've seen people, you know, I've, I've luckily been senior enough at times to intervene. Where I've seen with directors, someone, you, you've got someone who you can tell. You can tell they're nervous. and just sure. you, Because, you know, because what makes our job, what makes us professionals it, as opposed to, because I think lots of people play, lots of people act, um, are good actors. Probably, you know, but you have to do it when you don't want to do it, when the circumstances are not ideal and you have to do it under pressure. Yeah. You know, I remember I, a music thing. I had a band um, 
a little 12 years ago, 13, before my daughter was born. And uh, we, our friend ran the village studios in LA yeah. and, and he called up and he's like, I got, I got the studio open tomorrow. You can have it. I'll get you an engineer and you guys can lay down some of your songs. And the pressure in there was, you know, because the, what they call that red light, uh, red light fever. The red light fever, exactly. Yeah. And so you, you feel it. And we couldn't use any of the tracks because the drummer wasn't able to play to a click. And all of our, our songs, that you know, so we were like at 139 BPM. He's playing them all in like 160, 166. Oh, like it's, oh it's, no. It's, you can't, you, it's, it's lost the groove, right? And, but you learn that through experience. And, and now the next second time we went into the studio. So the same thing with on set. Like, you, you know, the first time you go to set, you're nervous, right? Sure. I, when I first went to do Memphis Bell, they brought us over for two weeks of rehearsal. I was so scared about, I was so intimidated about working with my idols um, that for the first week, I didn't speak pretty much. I just sat and listened and they thought I was mute. And then of course, by boot camp, then it's me. I don't shut up. And they're like, I think oh, that maybe you know, you know, my person, I was able to. Yeah. yeah. Maybe they were yeah, your advantage I mean, where they're like, this kid is young. He's respectful. He's, he, he's listening and not talking. And then when they saw that you're, you had all this natural ability and you could take direction and you were doing a great job. Then one day at craft service, somebody opens up to you and then the floodgates of, of friendship open. But, but it's over, but, it, but, but, you know, you can tell when someone's nervous and you, sure. you know, your job is to make them feel, cause it is pressurized, but it's funny. I just a sidebar on that. So I'm a young, little young 21 year old, uh, going off on my first movie. I flew over with DB, yeah. um, who you've had on your show, <laughs> DB and Harry Connick. And the first night, you know, DB was, he was a veteran and he was a little salty. And I looked up because I was a huge fan of his. I really loved his work. I, you know, eight men out. I was like, this guy's an actor. And, uh, and the first night he's like, we're going to, in my room, we're going to, we're going to have a, a poker game. I'm like, oh, okay. And this first time I've never been given per diem and per diem, obviously you get this spending money per day. And back then it was a lot of money. It was like, sure. I, don't know, I don't know if we got like a hundred pounds a day or 50 pounds a day or 60 pounds a day. And, and, and he tried to convince me. He's like, now he, he, I'm the young kid. He thinks like, oh, I'm going to take, I, I, he, I was the sucker, right? I'm the sucker in the room. And he was like, he tried to convince me, look, breathe, you know, just put your money, put all your, put all your per diem in the pot. Cause it's like, it's not real money. You, you, you didn't have this before today. I'm like, it's, I was pretty poor. It sounds like this seems like pretty real money to me. I think I could spend it. I think I could get a nice meal with this, take a girl out. But, um, but cut to the only good, the only shining, you know, uh, light in that story was, um, I, I, I just, I, I don't know why I'm not a particularly skilled poker player, but I ran the table. I was winning. And, and finally I had, I had the whole pot and I was like, I'm going to bed. He's like, you can't go to bed yet. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going to bed. You can't go to bed until we, I was like, no, it seems like the game. Like if you've won, you can leave anytime you want. Um, yeah, so, but, <laughs> so, but no, we, we've stayed friends since then. But yeah, I think you really do. Need, I, I believe all boats rise together, you know? Sure. And so, yeah. So in the studio, if you see, I mean, how, you can't play if you're nervous. You know, yeah. your fingers aren't going to find the fret, so you're not, you're going to get off the beat. And, and it's understandable that people be nervous. I mean, obviously, if it becomes, um, if it's chronic and you can't get over it, then maybe it's not, the, it's not necessarily the job for you. But because, yeah. I mean, there's so many times when I act, when, they, when they're like, uh, we've got one take to get this in, we're losing the light. And you're like, you've got two choices. You're like, I can implode right now, or I guess I got to fucking nail it. Put on my big boy pants but, and make this happen. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, Getting back to what I was, I was bringing up Marvel for a point. Yeah. Oh, please. One sorry. Of the reasons, one of the reasons why I, uh, I, I, I like that so much, I would imagine the whole series and the movies and such is because I feel like they have a good culture on the set. Like, you know, yeah. they, they introduced a lot of actors to the mainstream yeah. with that yeah. series of movies, you know, people that are working with big names that aren't really yeah. big names themselves. I mean, Hemsworth at that time was more of an Australian actor, yeah. uh, big in his own country. Of course he probably worked with big names, but you know, America's kind of the, the, the pinnacle of Hollywood and stuff like that. So when you're working with people like, you know, RDJ and, and, and all these other people, it's gotta be intimidating, but man, I think their culture must've been just so solid and that stuff, translates it gets it's, yeah 100 percent. it transfers to the audience you can tell when the, when a cast doesn't mesh you know i at oh, least yeah. i can yeah of course that's something that you feel yeah, like? yeah i well of course i mean i always think i i always think it shows up on the stage and i think you know from a music bands that play together and have good camaraderie make great music you know because they vibe off each other you know i mean and all my favorite bands like to record live in the room. Sure. And, you know, and I, and I think you can't, because the other thing too is, um, and this is just a personal philosophy about acting and same thing with music. It's like, I'm looking for the mistake 
because the mistake is the magic, right? So, and I'm looking to be surprised. So as an actor, when I'm on set, I don't want to run lines. I don't want to, I don't want you, I don't want to talk about it, I, especially because on film, I like, let's do it because, well, first of all, you, you, it's captured in this magical box. And now with, no, with no film on most shows, you can do it as many times as you want. Like, let's just see what happens. Yeah. And then, and I'm hoping it gets, um, I want it to get weird um, because, <laughs> because I know that my, I'm more, I always consider myself more of a reactor than an actor. I go, I'm, I can come up with shit in my house. I can come up with stuff before I come to work, but it's going to be only as, it's not that interesting. What's going to be more interesting is the thing that you and I created in that moment. And the same thing, when you're playing music, like suddenly someone hits a bum, you're not on a bum, you go on a different, you, you go in a different progression, you hit a different chord. And you're like, oh, wait, try that again. Or you, you know, you, do, you, you change the, te- the beat and you're like, oh, that's the song. Oh, let's, let's go with that. Let's try that, you know? Um, and that's, I always find you want to, cr- my goal is always to create a safe situation where we can, make a mistake not make a mistake where we can it can get crispy and we find something that neither of us you know we're one plus one equals infinity yeah. as opposed to like because if i come in with my and i'm as well and you know so the actors that tend to be the most domineering and not necessarily the most fun to play with have a plan and yeah. they know what they're going to do and they're very and some of them are quite skilled at it and i would think same with musicians they're sure. quite skilled at it but it's not fun to play with because it's impervious and um i mean yesterday i was just on set and we were fine and we we're you know i'm always trying to fuck it up a little bit and or if someone you know if they go hey read on this next one i'm like, I'm like don't, don't tell me what you're gonna do just just do it man just do it so There's it's no- like it, that's your improv training it's like i love i love that every actor and even like business people and comedians that we have on they everybody right. loves music so they draw that commonality mm. with music because it's yeah. a language Language. Like I know and understand the language of music because like you, it's been my business and I've been doing it for 44 years and it puts a roof yeah. over my head and I can wear my $80 Chuck Taylors instead of the $40 Chuck Taylors if I want, you know, thank right. God. Um, yeah. But, but you know, when, when I'm doing this new thing, even if it's just a scene study class and I have got my lines, but that other actor is going to determine everything that happens because of the way I react mm-hmm. to them. Yeah. Yeah. It's so exciting because it's yeah. almost like a language like music, but it's different, but it's, st- you're still being affected by the given circumstances of exactly. that period of time. Yeah, no, it's, it's and like, it's, and, and, and that's because that's what makes it fun because, you know, it's a child's game played at an adult level, right? So you're just playing pretend. Yes, so exactly. if we map it, if we map it, yeah, if we map it all out, it's really boring. It's so funny because sometimes, you know, I'll have to, you know, cause I work with so many different people and you work with different directors and you know, there's nothing I hate more than when they go like, okay, when you get to that line, you know, three pages in on the scene, I want you to, and I'm like, and I go, maybe, and they go, maybe I go, I don't know what's going to happen by the time we get there. <laughs> like, cause we're, cause I always feel like preparation. You talked about that, you know, in the given circus, the preparation, and Stanford Misers obviously said this much better than I did, but I always look at it like this, the preparation is the ski lift and it gets me to the top of the run. And then each take is a run. And some of them, you know, some of them are really good runs. Some are very different. Some, some of the runs aren't very good, right? Or, <laughs> you know, you might wipe out, but that's fine. You know, but you'll discover stuff that are, is much more interesting than anything you could have planned. You know, if I have to know I got to be angry by at the end of the scene, Maybe I don't. I mean, and uh, maybe that's that's the least interesting choice in that moment. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I think it's it's that conf- the constant battle or, or it's not battle. It's it's the constant discipline. I think is yeah. a better word is being comfortable enough with not knowing and being willing to go into that space and not know and be. Uh, and, comf- and be w- able to create in that. And I mean, yes, I was, we had a scene and we were doing it and I could just, gears weren't, I'm working with a wonderful actor and, and the gears weren't quite lining up, the dialogue and, and I go, and I just stood back and you could feel they're, you know, they're talking over in the video village. You go, okay, this is a moment where we could just sort of give up and just think about what cocktail I'm going to have when I get out of here. Or you go, no, let's keep, let's keep hammering away. That's, this is the work, you know, you know, it's, and with music, cause I was thinking like, you're just like, it's, it's just the bridge isn't right. We're not going in, you know, let's just keep, let's keep playing. We'll find it. And then you find it. And then take four. You're like, oh, okay, this all came together. We're in a different thing because you're doing it together. That's it. All right, let's show that opened up some, another pathway in your brain. You go, okay. Oh, yeah. cause that was what happened yesterday. Something messed up. And I go, oh, oh, maybe, 
okay, maybe try this. And, and oh, he's, I might bring in another color from my palette. Um, but it's not, because this, your brain is the worst. You know, your instincts are the best. Like, you know, sure. we have skills, right? So you, that's what you train for. That's why, you know, you run your scales or you, I mean, you know, what you do. I, I don't even know how you, I don't know how you even just do your feet. That's the one that's still like, <laughs> how you do your feet and your hands. Those are mine. I'm hearing you. You're changing up those kick beats and stuff like that. It's just, it's, I just, I'm so in awe. And the stamina that it requires to be the engine of the band. Um, but, um, you know, you're training, so you know you have that that's there to fall back on. And so that you can just sort of get lost and, uh, and, 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 and go with your instinct. Because this, whatever comes through you, that's why I think probably people go, you know, if you believe in God, you go like God's working through me or the muse or whatever you're saying. Because sure. you know that whatever came out of you, I... I didn't consciously create that. I just allowed it to happen. Like a vessel. Um, it's like a vessel. I mean, there's, you, you know that book, The War of Art? Sure. Yeah. So he talks about that. Like your job is to set up the, the opportunity for the muse to come out. And that's why, because I do think, I was just having a conversation um, with a person who's taking a philosophy of the art class. And I was just like, is it craft or is it art? And I go, the craft is in getting yourself to the place where you can create art. Because I think acting can be crafty. I know a lot of great craftsmen and that's fine. You'll do it. You'll be able to, I'll, I'll understand what's going on. You know, the sort of stereotypical old school British actor, you're very clear. You're indicating what's going on. I know what's happening. I can follow. Great. But I feel like, you know, my job, you, but the artist allows, you know, great actors that you love, you know, something personal, something re, well, also whatever's happening is really happening. You know, there's no fakery. I'm um, yeah. really happy in that experience. You're living truthfully under imaginary circumstances. Um, I love that. Well, thank you. Thank you, you for the agree? acting lesson. That's <laughs> <laughs> very insightful. Very would insightful. Would you agree that a lot of actors, if they can act badly on purpose, like if a script calls for them to act badly, is that a sign of a good actor? That, no, that is, that's all you want. Like that's, I literally, at times I, for years, I said, that's all I got from Juilliard was my best bad actor impersonation. <laughs> Cause I, you're watching, you're watching, uh, uh, we watched the whole series of the, um, um, uh, uh, mocking Jay, uh, Jennifer Lawrence, uh, yeah, yeah, Hunger yeah. Games. Exactly. and there's a scene in the first mocking Jay movie where she has to get up in front of a green screen kind of thing and do this big proclamation about how Pam, Am, we're going to do this. And she just, you know, everyone's just in the control room going, no, I'm not feeling it. And it's funny cause she's, you know, she's an actress and she's, you got to act badly. You yeah. Know? I'm like, that's gotta be a challenge. Yeah, it's know? playing drums badly. It's like, you know, John trying to play like Johnny, the eighth grade drummer that goes to guitar center on Saturday. Is like, you know, it's like, but, and then I, you know, I'll see that kid on Saturday morning in guitar center. I'll be like, Hey kid, listen, slow it down. Keep it at the same tempo. You literally be playing the beat that'll buy you a house and pay your mortgage for the rest of your life. Yeah. Let's gotta refine advice. it. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. Jim, this is that part of the show. You know what I'm talking about. I do. It's the, the random question, random question, random question of the day. Read. Nice. Ooh, nice. All right, here we go. I'm going right. to hit him. I'm going to go here. We go. So a, what is the uh, random okay. question of the day? I'm, I'm finding a random question. Okay. I'm going through questions right now that are random that I'm going to find one I like. So, where do you, where do you call these questions from? Uh, a, a website that will okay. remain nameless. Okay, great, great, great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my God, my oh, here's a good one. Here's a good one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, roundandbrown.com. How well do you cope when you don't have your phone with you for an extended period of time? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> I, I hate this thing. I hate this thing. Oh my God. No, it's so funny because I mean, 
yes, there's conveniences to it. I love that my daughter can reach me. I love that my wife can reach me. I love that, but no. And I love that I have a little computer at times, but no. Oh, I hate it. Oh, it's the best. No, I love going. I go camping. I go off the grid as often as possible. You know what sometimes I do? I used to do. Um, I used to tell my, I used to tell my agents, uh, um, I'm off the grid. I would tell people I was camping even when I wasn't, when I was in my house, cause I didn't want anyone to call me. Oh my God. No, I love it because, you know, because with this, you know, as you as we learned from the social dilemma, this thing is using us. We're the, you know, we're, it's controlling us. We're not, we're not controlling it. Did you watch it, Jim? Did you watch the social dilemma? My wife and I want to watch it. And then I think we want to watch it with the kids. Well, you know what I did after I watched it? I took a 10 day break from Instagram. Mm-hmm. And my, my life, I didn't miss it. I don't know if you, there's a break there, Jim. I mean, it's like, I mean, I've been on this thing every day since it, and I use it to promote my business, right? Yeah. But I took a break and it was amazing. Yeah. yeah. That's the thing. Like no. Yeah. Because it's like, you do, you're reachable at all times. And now with all of the social media stuff, like people are reaching like, why, I'm like, dad, why are you sending me messages through Facebook? You know, my phone number, right? Like this is not a place to reach me or like, you know, what did I, I just, I signed up for an app that charts my, my bike rides and my hikes. And suddenly I've got friends on there and they're sending me, I'm like, no, there's one place to reach me. You can either call me or text me. Why are you de- DMing me? Like people want to be your friend on Venmo. I'm like, no, I don't want people to know like, watching my monetary transactions. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks What's for the, the culture on gift. set? Do you do you Rich leave said, your Rich sent Jim a, a Rich said Jim money. Thanks for the <laughs> yeah. Thanks for, thanks for the thanks carrots. For that, thanks for the last night dinner. I, I like. Oh no, the worst thing is like my adult male friends who like my texts. I'm like, don't like my texts. That is, I'm like, I'm out. I'm out. I'm not liking your text. <laughs> yeah, it's a funny thing. But, but what were you going to say, Rich? You were gonna- I'm sorry. I was going to say, um, what, what's the culture on set now? Do you just leave it in your trailer? Because I think that the if there's, you're working with a young actor, they probably have this thing in their hands and it's like three, two, one, action. They put it away. Well, that's the thing. You know, it's, I think it's, it's funny. You, you brought up such a perfect example because I think it's one of the worst things that ever happened to sets because the best part about actors getting together and having downtime sitting on set is they tell stories sure. and they tell great stories. Actors are just, they're just, you know, you're lucky to be with interesting people. This ruined that. So, I mean, I was so lucky, you know, the, when I did Franklin and Mash for years, I worked with one of my great biggest heroes of all time, Malcolm McDowell. And wow. he doesn't bring his phone. So he and I, and he's like, oh, that time Oliver Reed and I were running through the <laughs> And you're just like, you're like, oh, tell me it's more. A good impression. Yeah, so oh, I, I, oh, I got one after four years with him. But yeah, so I never bring this, I don't bring this fucking thing to set. It's also like, it's going to take me out of the thing, unless there's an emergency, unless my someone's in the hospital or I've had, you know, I need to talk to my daughter. That thing stays in my trailer. And then I find at times you can create a culture where, because I love talking to actors. I love learning about people and, or talking to anybody, but it has become, it's, it's sick. You know, there were people who were, keep, keep on it until rolling. Um, and uh, I, it's been... It's been, a, it's been an unfortunate addition to set. Because what are you doing? You're checking your goddamn social media. Like, who cares? All day who long. Who cares? And, and then this thing, like, I mean, every time, I know it's, it's very sick, but every time someone falls off a cliff in Hawaii doing this, I'm, I, I know, right? <laughs> it's just, I mean, I am just, I mean, I do. I, I was at Glyph, Griff the Zer, Zer, like, and then, it's yes, like, I know it's like my horse tranquilizer just kicked in. Uh, speaking of Keith drugs, Moon loved <laughs> horse tranquilizer because I thought this was only going to be a one-hour interview, so I knew I was going to peak in an hour. But there yeah. we go. I'm at the Griffith Observatory, and you're seeing people, you know, take risks that you can't believe. I was just hiking in Hawaii. I was working there. We're on like the one of the craters, and you're going. You're, it's, it, it, they could not put one more sign that says, "Please don't go to the edge." And I, but it's social Darwinism, right? Um, even though yeah. that has a that has a there's no, an account called Influencers in the Wild. Oh, nice. <laughs> And it's basically people catching other people doing the influencer thing. It's, it's yeah. really funny. Well, it is um, very interesting because it's fake too, right? Because that's like yeah. half the time they're not on their phone, right? It's a pretend selfie. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and it's very posed and not authentic and not in the moment. Ugh. Very prepared. So, so Reed, you're so accomplished, man. What's coming oh up God. that you can share? Yes. So, I mean, I just, um, this, I'm on the new season of 13 Reasons Why that just sort of broke in the last few months. Uh, so that's exciting. Uh, I've, I've just completed the beginning of the first uh, new season of Leverage. They brought that show back. Wow. And right nice. now I am in the midst of shooting the, uh, fi- the seventh and final season of the Amazon incredible show, Bosch. 
Oh my oh, God, dude! Yeah, that's incredible. So yeah, it's nice to it's nice to go back to work. Oh my um, God! Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been busy. It's nice to be back at work. And um, yeah, so Bosch, Thirteen Reasons, which is great. I mean, also people are catching all the old stuff because everyone's in their house, especially during quarantine. Sure. Um, we got a lot of new designated survivor fans, and certainly you know, and uh, it's it's even like movies. I'm seeing movies that I'm like much ado about nothing that I did with Joss. That thing's I suddenly got. A, I've never seen a residual check from that thing, and now people are renting it because they've run out. They've run out of stuff. So soon, <laughs> soon, soon um, maybe <laughs> soon I'll get a check for my uh, Awake to Danger with Tori Spelling TV movie or maybe, you know, uh, you, you don't know. The truth about Edward Brannigan with Brian Dennehy that we mentioned earlier. Have you, have you gone to Residuals Bar and Grill on Ventura there? And- you know, I never have. I know because okay. if, you, if you go with one that's under a dollar, right? Yeah, they'll you- put it up. Yeah, uh, I've gotten those. We had the, uh, you know, homicide. I, they were all 15 cents, I think, for the most part. But it adds yeah. up. Sure yeah. it does. My God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm very superstitious. I, 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 uh, I deposit all of those checks. For sure. Hey, yeah. so we were talking about social media. Do you like to be found? Where can people find you? Yeah, you can. After I just just completely um, lambasted social media, <laughs> yeah. discouraged it. Yes, you can find my beautiful face on Instagram at, at Reed Diamond Presents because there's some other Reed Diamond at Reed Diamond Presents. And on Twitter, I'm Sounds just like a at, concert promoter. Reed Diamond at, Presents. At Reed, that's, that's what I was going. That's exactly what I was going for. Reed Diamond Presents. Michael Schur Presents at the Matt Nassau Coliseum. Focus. No, um, <laughs> and then Reed Twitter. Diamond. Reed Diamond. In and concert. I'm just at, in concert with his pants. What? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just at Reed Diamond uh, at Twitter. But yeah, those are the places to find me, which I'd love to be found. Um, so, and when it's time to play music again, you're going to you're gonna call me, you're going to call a drummer that can play with a click, and we could do it live in the studio in Toronto, we could do it live in Los Angeles, or you could just send me the files, and I'll record them in Nashville and send them back to you. <laughs> I would love that. I would love that because it's just usually just me p- programming easy drummer. And don't, uh, <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. You call it, get a real drummer. Get a real drummer. It's such a and pleasure course, speaking a, to you guys. Oh, when, man. You need a vo- when you need a voice guy for designated survivor, just let me know. No, Jim, I'm going to have you actually will. I'm going to have you record all of my outgoing messages. And uh, <laughs> you have reached Reed Diamond. Press one. Leave a message. Yeah. Yes. Leave a Bottle message bus. if you dare. What? Stay again. Yes. Out. Yes. Sold out. Prime. Well, man, I you've been s- so mind. inspirational, buddy. Really <laughs> inspiring. And I hope to keep in touch with you. Thanks so much for sharing your time and talent with us, man. Thank you. This has been an absolute pleasure. Jim, Rich, I just love talking to you. Uh, this is so much fun. This is a highlight, highlight, highlight of my October. I love it. Now you can go and have, get some wine there in wine country. Well, I'm going to get, I'm going to get steaming. Gonna as get we pissed. said, right after I'm going to get pissed. <laughs> <laughs> Wicked pisser. Well, we, it's a wicked piece out. Oh, speaking of accents, this, I know. I know oh, here you go. The Boston accent. Oh, Come on, gosh. people. Like, like, eight, you know, wow, what percentage of the country speaks that? It is so overly prevalent on TV compared to the percentage in the actual population. Boston. That's that's my last. That's my final yeah. point, kids. Um, it's just a little overrepresented. You heard it here first <laughs> on the Rich Redmond Show. And for all you guys and gals that are listening and watching and consuming in all your various ways out there, we appreciate it. Um, be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. It sure does help us. We're on all platforms. And if you got some praise for us, send it to us. It's the Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com. Keep coming back for the good stuff. We'll see you guys soon. Thanks, Reed. This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe. Rate and follow along at richredmond.com.